Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is video 11 from the Beginner to Chess Master playlist, which is a progressive series of videos. And we're going to have a look at the element of time in chess. In every chess game, there's a race going on, a time race. And I'm not speaking of the time on the clocks or the time controls, but rather the time on the chessboard itself. We take turns in chess, and when it's our turn, we can only make one move, we know this. We have exactly one unit of time, one tempo, in other words. There's a time race, and it begins at move one. The race is to see who can completely mobilize their entire army first. Who can better improve the overall quality of their position. Now, we're already familiar with the material element in chess, and it isn't too hard a task to keep track of who is up material-wise, point-wise. Uh, in fact, many chess-playing websites out there will provide you with a crutch where having an answer to that who's up material-wise question is a cinch. Off to the side, they'll show you the captured pieces and or some combination of... Uh, it, it'll, they'll show you the numerical value that represents material. Time, just like material, plays a very important role in the game, sometimes a far more important role in the game when compared to material. There is no crutch for the time element though. You have to interpret the position and assess the time element all on your own and you ought to keep track of it or at the very least have a very good sense of who is up at any point in the game, who is up time-wise. So, what I'm going to share with you in this video is a way you can keep track of time so that by this video's end you'll always have an answer to the question, who is winning the time race? Uh, having an answer to this question will ultimately help us make better decisions when playing. It's not just about having an answer to that time question, who's up time-wise. It's about how we can apply it. How is this useful? Uh, how can we better improve as a player by knowing this information? Just, and bear with me here, I recognize this is a lot of me just talking right now, but I do have several examples. I will show you that shortly, but there's a certain point I need to make here. Just as we are already familiar with the a general principle in relation to material, it's already been shared that when we have a material advantage, a material plus, a good general principle is to make even exchanges, to simplify the position so that one day, hopefully, when we are up a pawn, we can simplify it all the way down so it's king and pawn versus king, and we're already experts with how to successfully promote that pawn. Similarly, once we know who is up time-wise, there are general principles that will also guide our play. Some strategies we can follow when we know who is up time-wise. So we're going to see how we can keep track of it, and I'll show several examples of how we can maybe be losing time and not even realizing it. Okay? So here's the first example right here. And don't pay too much attention to what Black's doing. <laughs> They're doing a developing move, which is not a good developing move, and then underdeveloping. Focus on what white is doing. Every move thus far is great. It's getting a new piece out, and white is getting one step closer with each move to this position right here, where the rooks are in direct connection with one another. This right here is what many regard as being fully developed. I've referenced it as this many times uh, most most cases i represent uh, or i call having a direct connection between the rooks as being fully developed i'd like to adjust that statement a little bit i'd like to be a little bit more exact here this direct connection between the rooks is an excellent reference point and it's the one we're going to use to gauge time okay this is an excellent start but do know that we are not quite where we want to be as white. We're far ahead here, time-wise, 
Uh, we have, it took us eight moves to get to this point, and if black is to get their pieces out, the best case scenario, it ta it's going to take them eight moves from this position. Uh, we still do know, we still, as white, need to do a couple more things. As I've already referenced in a previous video in this series, we're still seeking a pawn break so that a file can become half opened or opened and we also need to move the rook to that half open or open file so we're very close here as white n no doubt about that but do know that we're not quite where we want to be we are not fully mobilized as white but this is an excellent reference point this is where we want to be this is what we will use to gauge who is doing better time-wise as it stands right now, white is ahead by 8 tempi. Okay, I know it's a very exaggerated example, but I just wanted to draw uh, some attention to having a direct connection between the rooks. It will take black 8 moves before they could be in a similar position with their rooks in direct contact with one another. Okay, let's have a look at an example here. It's something... I found interesting. Many players do this. Many of these examples, by the way, are pulled from standard chess games played. I was uh, doing some research online, and I found some interesting examples for time here, ways that we can be losing time. So far, not too bad. In fact, let me just back up. It may help when playing to categorize your moves and your opponent's moves as A, developing, or B, non-developing. If you don't like those words, you could also view it as productive or unproductive. The first move here, D4, is a good one. I'll just stick with the move developing. It's a developing move. It's opening a door for the bishop. This is a great start. Black, on the other hand, it's not opening a door for the bishop with this pawn move but it does influence the center of the board. It's striking at a pawn that's in the center, so there is some value to that. Okay, this is still a fine move. White develops. That's good. Black eliminates that central pawn. Okay. White is recapturing. Black is getting on with a developing move. Another developing move because it frees the bishop. So there's now a door open for the white bishop. There's a door open for the black bishop. E5 is developing. It opens a door for the dark square bishop. So far, so good. Knight F3, you have to react. D6, a new door for the bishop. And now, the move B3. I have a problem with this move. The move B3, I interpret as follows. I, I see this as white saying, you know what? The one door that's open for my bishop isn't good enough. I don't like it enough to go out that door. I'm going to open up a new door. I'm going to spend one of my moves and open up a new door because I think my bishop will be better placed here. I don't like the move. There's one door already open. I don't think there's enough justification here for white to invest a move to deploy the bishop uh, through a, a different door. Okay. A better move is knight c3 or bishop c4 and then getting on with castles. What's wrong with bishop e3 or bishop g5 one day pinning the knight? This is a waste of time and I see it quite often. It, it's For some reason, it's, it's not good enough to have just one door open for the bishop. He only needs one door. You just picture the bishop in, in a house, right? There's, there's a house, a bishop in it, and the house has two doors. Both are currently closed. How does the bishop get out of the house? He opens one door and goes through it. He doesn't open two doors and then picks one to go out. One door and he goes through it, okay? This is a waste of time, and I see it quite often, okay? Maybe you can relate to it. If that's the case, fix it. Save yourself your time. This is a waste of time. You don't need to do this. This is, this is a step in the direction of wasting time. Let's have a look at another example here. Alrighty. So far, so good. Developing, great. The bishop's ready to come out. E6, developing. The bishop's ready to come out. 
Knight f3, another developing move. Bishop c5, another developing move. But I have a problem with this one. Can you identify what the problem is? Here's the problem. What's white going to do? d4. What just happened here? White developed, right, opened a new door for the bishop and did so with an attack against an already developed piece. So what does this mean for black? It means that he should be reacting. He has to move this developed piece, right? It's black's move. He would like to get a new piece involved, but because he played bishop c5, d4 hits, and he has to move again. So black is, by playing bishop c5, helping white to accentuate his development. He's speeding up uh, white's task of fully mobilizing uh, the pieces, okay? Let's take just a few more moves. Suppose bishop check. What's white doing? Developing and blocking. What's black doing? Moving an already developed piece again. What's white doing? Developing. Let's just pause for a moment. How do we stand time-wise? Who's winning the time race here? Uh, if we look on the white side, bishop needs to move, knight needs to move, the king needs to castle before the rooks are in direct connection. White needs three moves before they are fully, or excuse me, not fully developed, but three moves before there's a direct connection between the rooks. Black, on the other hand, how many moves are needed? A knight move. King has to castle, that's two. Uh, the queen has to move, three. The knight has to move, four. A door, one door, needs to be opened for the bishop. That's five. The bishop needs to move, six. So the time plus is in favor of white. Let's move forward just a little bit. Knowing that we have this time edge, these last few moves are all developing moves for both sides. A door is open, developing, developing, developing. What do we do when we have a time edge? What is a good general principle to follow when we have a time advantage? In this position, white already has this direct connection between the rooks. Black still needs a knight move, a queen move, and, well, one of the, another piece has to move and then the queen. So there's a time advantage here for white. What's a good general principle? When you have a time advantage, you should seek pawn exchanges. The move d5 is an excellent way to do that, engaging with the pawns. Why would you want to do this? What's the big idea here? One thing I want to make clear. I don't want you to memorize here. Uh, you are up material-wise. Me just saying to you, well, when you're up material-wise, or excuse me, when you're up time-wise, make pawn exchanges open the position. Are you, are you satisfied with that answer? You shouldn't be, because I have not yet provided any reasons for why you should do that. The, those are the important questions. Having the answers to those why questions, those critical thinking questions, are what is important. It's, that's what's going to take you from simply memorizing to understanding uh, why, why we do this. Why should we be seeking pawn exchanges? Let's have a very close look at why this is the case. Why should we open the position when we have an edge, when we have an advantage time-wise? Let's see. Pawn exchanges, what will result with this type of capture? The opening up of a file. These already developed these the more developed pieces that we have are now becoming optimized the possibilities that are now present for our pieces are uh, becoming greater note notice the possibilities now for the queen and the rook if as we look at it right now they stop cold along the d file as far as the d3 square if the d pawn is no longer around now look at the potential for both queen and rook d3 d4, d5, d6, d7. Okay. Uh, creating pawn exchanges will open files, will open diagonals, will help to optimize uh, the pieces that we already have 
developed. This is why we should seek pawn exchanges and welcome the opening up of the position. The pawn captures uh, are what we are welcome to when we have that time edge. It mobilizes our pieces. We have more possibilities. And the more possibilities we have, the better. Okay? Um, that's really as far as I want to take it here. This time edge is still present, and there's a lot of pressure against uh, the black position, the D pawn, the rook are hit. But uh, just want to emphasize we're up time wise. A good general principle is to seek pawn exchanges. And let's look at the flip side of things here, too. Should it be the case where you're down time wise? Are you going to be so welcome to having the position open up? No. So, should a decision come about where you can make a pawn capture or a pawn advance to close the position, maybe you should be looking to close the position if you're down time wise. Okay, so it works both ways here. It's not just about, okay, you have a time advantage, open the position. Let's look at the flip side of things. If you're down time wise, hang on. I probably want to keep the position closed. Okay, let's have a look at another example here. Give me a moment, I bring it up. There we go. Developing move, developing move. Creating a pawn duo, striking at the center. It doesn't help out one of the bishops with this move, but it's still a fine move. It's contributing to uh, the center of the board and having an influence on the pawn structure in the center. Uh, just as a, a rough guide, moving, making about, let's say, three pawn moves in the early stage of the game is, is probably a, a, a good number of pawn moves. Going beyond that, well, you better have some pretty good justification for it, but just giving you a rough feel. Three pawn moves is usually sufficient. Uh, maybe even a fourth with the capture and such, but just giving you a ballpark figure. In order to be fully mobilized, for those that are more on the mathy side, I know that's pretty much my mentality to try and look at the chessboard uh, and use, use some logic wherever I can. Just giving you as a rough guide approximately 12 moves and you should be really really close really really close to having your entire army mobilized I'm not talking right now just about that direct connection between the rooks I'm talking about going beyond that having the pawn break in or I should say creating the pawn tension as, as white is doing at this very early moment creating the pawn tension at some point making a capture and then making use of that open file. So roughly 12 moves to get that entire army, 12 tempi to get your entire army mobilized. Okay. So let's move forward here. Still identifying certain moves as developing, non-developing. Okay. This has, it's a productive move. It's reinforcing the central point. Knight F3, Knight F6. And moving forward a little bit. So far, so good. Developing for both sides. Knight there, b3, preparing bishop here. The, this, by the way, uh, here's another point. Um, you know, I was drawing emphasis very early on to, well, there's already a door open here. What in the world are you doing wasting some time? Earlier I said, you know, is it, why not open up one door and just go out it? This is a different story right here. Uh, as white, if the bishop is just playing to d2... It's kind of a, a half-developing move. It's off the back rank, but it really isn't doing much. Uh, in this particular case, it is worthwhile investing this tempo to deploy the bishop here. It's worth the time to do that in this case here. Uh, I see moves like this played um, you know, quite often. I, I would say, in lower-level games. They're, they're familiar with getting the pieces out the back rank, but sometimes these half-developing moves are played, and it's just not a product. In the end, it isn't a productive piece. In this particular case, it's good to invest an in additional tempo and get the bishop on the longest diagonal in the chessboard. Okay? In that earlier position, the bishop had other options. It could have played to e3 or g5, which were excellent choices. Not the case here okay uh so h6 bishop b2 this by the way is not a developing move but 
Okay, sometimes the king would like to go here later. But this is the point that I would like to bring your attention to. It's black's move here. And black now plays the move queen to c7. How do you feel about that move? How would you identify, how would you describe that move? Is it a developing move? Is it a non-developing move? If you'd like to pause the video and try and work that one out on your own, feel free to do that. I'm just going to dive right into the explanation. Queen c7, developing or not developing? What do you think? The answer, it's a developing move. But it's a developing move that will eventually backfire on black. I want you to notice something here, and this will... This will draw your attention to anticipating certain structural changes within a chess game, uh, certain pawn captures. As it stands right now, notice that there is tension on the d5 pawn. There's an attacker, and there's a defender. And should white choose to do so, he, can, uh, he or she can capture on the d5 square. And after the smoke clears, whether it's pawn takes right away or knight takes, let's just say knight takes, after the smoke clears, what ends up happening? When pawns make captures, something changes, files change, something's changed with the C file. It's now opened, and how comfortable do you think the queen is on this now completely open file when there are still both rooks on board? The answer, not comfortable at all. Soon, white will be able to make a move like this, rook to C1, gaining a move against the queen, developing the rook to an open file, and now this already developed piece has to do what? Move again. Black is wasting time by playing the move queen to c7. On the surface, it appears that the queen is developed because she's off the back rank, but she will have to lose time. Black will have to lose time if white goes in for this exchange on this square. After rook here, even though there's a knight in the way, there's already the threat to move the knight with the discovered attack against the queen. She does not stand well on this c7 square. The c file, and this, is, this takes some practice, but recognizing certain pawn tension like this, having an attacker and a defender, uh, viewing this position here with these pawns, uh, viewing it as if they are both no longer there, looking at the attacker and the defender, viewing it as... You know, them vanishing here. The C file can open up in a blink. The queen does not sit well here. So this takes a little bit more work to view it like this, but this is a another way that you can be losing time. Okay, it's a little bit more involved, but uh, it's important to, to recognize these finer points here. The small, small ways you may be losing time, and time will add up. Okay. So let's dive right into another example here. There we go. Developing. Striking at the center. Okay. It's not developing, but this is quite often a pawn that can cause the opponent some problems. Notice it does take away uh, a square from that queen knight. It could be quite uncomfortable having a pawn in your position, and that's what black is having to now work around. Okay, e6 opens a door for the bishop. c4, it reinforces this pawn. Developing, developing, developing. Here's a door for the bishop. Another developing move, the bishop's ready to come out. So not too bad. And this is where I have a problem. Similar to one of the first examples I shared with you, we have the move b6. What's going on here? This, this diagonal is not good enough. This pawn could make a capture and the bishop can make use of g4 at some point. This is a waste of time. And I'd like to go one step further. With this uh, pawn configuration, deploying the bishop here is equivalent to having the bishop one day simply bite on a rock. Okay, This pawn is going nowhere. A bishop on b7 is doesn't even have... Let's, let's fast forward a little bit. Actually, not, not, not too fast. Uh, this bishop b7 move uh, a bishop on the b7 square isn't even threatening to enter the white position at all. It's not even observing any square on white's part. It's of no bother to white. 
uh, if it's staring right at the d5 pawn, which is a, an excellent strong point in the white position. Now what follows is another, it's another move that I have a problem with time-wise. Knight b5, what, what are you doing here? You're moving an already developed piece. You've gotten away. As white, you've gotten away from what it is you ought to be doing in a chess game. Fully mobilizing your pieces. And also let me point this out. There are going to be times in a chess game where your opponent will do something that is equivalent to maybe, I don't know, waving a stick right in front of your face, trying to distract you. Okay, Don't be distracted. Know what it is you ought to be doing in a chess game and do it. You're supposed to be getting all of your pieces out and do just that. Uh, knight b5, I'm not sure what the story is with this move. What's wrong with knight f3? Bishop d3, the bishop coming out. This is moving an already developed piece. Again, it's a waste of time. And I don't know what is even threatening. This this knight, you, you really want to, if you're going to be advancing like this as white, you, you really should have more pieces involved. This knight is just going into no man's land. Um, if the black pieces carried some emotion and they were to speak, I mean, they're laughing right now. I mean, what, what do you think you're doing here? You're abs you're no threat to me whatsoever. In fact, what happened was a six, he got kicked and he went right back. Is there a way you can now make use of, uh, having the pawn on a six when compared to a seven? No. Okay. That was a complete waste of time. Okay. Moving forward. That's a developing move. Another developing move. Developing but biting on a rock and now pawn takes so this is uh, one other point and the last point from this example here what did white just do he made this pawn capture so pawn capture is the interesting interesting moment right here uh, white needs to recognize that for as long as they maintain this pawn on d5 the bishop is a dead piece he's just staring at a pawn that is really really well reinforced it can't get more reinforced pawn wise than this so this pawn should be maintained he is excellent in fact if we look from a time standpoint how much time was invested with this d pawn uh, how many moves how many tempi uh, were spent in order to get the pawn to d5 well let's see one two two tempi to get to that point and now what does white do all that time and effort, I know it's just two moves, but all that time and effort to get to d5, and what did White do? He threw it all away. He's like, I don't, I, you know what, I, I don't want to have my pawn on d5 anymore. That was an excellent pawn you're getting rid of. You may want to view it as exchanging off a fifth rank pawn, White's fifth rank pawn, for Black's second rank pawn. Okay, this is an excellent pawn right here. Right? After this capture, chop, chop, it is as if the d5 pawn was exchanged for the f7 pawn. This was a really strong pawn on d5, and it was given away. Some time was lost here, playing d4, d5, and then making another pawn move, capturing. It is not time well spent. There are more efficient ways to uh, play this position out. Knight f3, perfectly uh, a perfect move to play. Bishop e7 as a follow-up, okay? Getting all of your pieces out is the name of the game. And in these examples, we're not even 10 moves into the game, and there are already these uh, adjustments that could be uh, made. These uh, short, well, not short, but these minor improvements, they again, they add up. These little ways you could be losing time uh, can add up, all right? Uh, let's move forward here uh, look at another example about uh, five more examples to go through here's another one right here okay developing 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 and knight to e7 uh, if we're just to pause right here I know it's very early but who's winning the time race here okay white to be expected right he has two moves in black has one uh, yeah, how many do we need? One, two, three, four. A door has to open. Five, six moves, and black still needs seven. Okay, after black's next move, knight e7, uh, does he still need, you know, does he need uh, six moves or seven moves? Where, where does black stand? In fact, right now, where does black stand 
time-wise. He still has to move the knight, bishop, king, queen, knight. A door has to be open for the bishop. One, uh, one of these two right here. So one, two, three, four, five, six with the pawn move, and then seven. After knight e7, you would think it's now six, but it's still seven. Why? The bishop has to move still. And how's he getting out? You just blocked him in. This was his door to come out, and now the knight's in the way. So in order to complete kingside development, black has to open, has to go about it how? Opening a new door and playing to g7, or moving the knight again, and then moving the bishop. So this is not a developing move. It may appear on the surface that it's a developing move, but it's not. It's getting in the way of black's development. It would be a far uh, different story if the bishop was already out and then the knight played here. Okay, different story. Not the case, though. Black is wasting time with a move like this. Just as was highlighted opening up a second door to get the bishop out, what about playing your knight to a position and the bishop can now no longer move on an already opened door, out of an outer, out of an already opened door? This is not productive. This is, again, what one might think is developing, but it is not. Okay, it's, it's getting in the way. Black is no better off having the knight on e7 uh, in this position. What, what's wrong with knight to f6? Okay, or playing playing here. Knight e7 is not good. This is not helping Black's development. Let's have a look at another one here. Give me a moment. There we go. Okay, d4, d5, c4, e6. So far, so good, right? Developing, developing. Forming a pawn duo, striking at the center, not bad, it's good. e6, opens a door for this guy, knight c3 is developing, 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 developing. This is another case where it's actually a good one. Um, it, it could be a little bit tricky, I know, opening up two doors <laughs> for the bishop uh, in, in some situations, I'm saying it's uh, not a good. It's not worthwhile to uh, open up a new door, spend a time, spend a tempo to get the bishop on a different diagonal. In this particular case, it is uh, playing the bishop here is one of those half developing moves. Um, it is better placed on this square, so this is time well spent to play b6 and get the bishop on this square. Uh, also. I mean, if we have a look at what black's going to do with the knight, I mean, if he goes here while well, he's getting in the bishop's way, this is actually a good square for the knight because when compared to c6, uh, I've already referenced that when the d-pawns are in play like this, when the d-pawns are on these fourth ranks, what does that c-pawn like to do? He likes to move. Whether it be one or two squares forward, he likes to have the option to move. So obstructing this guy with the knight, not really a good idea. Uh, in fact, if that did happen, where, where does the queen eventually go? What's the bishop go? There's a little bit of a, a space disadvantage uh, for black here. Tough to find squares for the pieces. If if the knight played here and we had something like this with the queen stepping up and then the bishop playing here, well, look at how cluttered this is here. In fact, c5 already would win the queen. Uh, the short story here is that this is a justified uh, second door to open for the bishop. B6 is fine. A3, it's not a developing move, but uh, I just wanted to play this to emphasize the following point. We now have the move by black, and D takes C. Uh, before I put this move on the board here, uh, let's take stock of where we stand time-wise for each side. Let's not lose sight of who is winning the time race. So let's do a quick count here. How are things looking on the white side? How many moves before white is uh, before white has that direct connection between the rooks? A bishop needs to move. That's one. The king needs to castle. That's two. The queen needs to move. Three. Three moves for white. What about black? Black still needs. Let's just say. Let's just say it like this. Black still needs to address the knight, bishop, and queen. Still three pieces to get out, okay? It's black's move in this position 
and black captures on c4. What does white do? And this move, by the way, how might you describe it? It's a move that breaks up a pawn duo. Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's not a developing move, but it does address the center of the board, the pawn structure in some way, this capture. So let's just say d takes c here, and now what does white do? White recaptures. And now, how do we stand time-wise? Well, white is one step closer to having that direct connection between the rooks. In fact, white now only needs two moves before there is that direct connection between the rooks. Black, on the other hand, well, it's the same story. Knight, bishop, and queen still have to do something productive. Uh, let's backtrack for a moment here. I'd like to emphasize drawing your attention right now to the timing of certain moves. When certain moves are played can influence the uh, the time element. <laughs> That's uh, probably a better way to state it like that, but the, let's just say the moment at which you make certain moves has an influence on the time element. Black is capturing this pawn at a moment when the bishop has not yet moved. If we compare this with the following, suppose, instead of capturing at this moment here, suppose black plays bishop b7. And after white says, well, I want to get castled, so I need to move my bishop, and plays bishop to d3. How about now? How about black now captures on c4? Chop, chop. How are things looking in this position? Still two moves for white, but black, on the other hand, only has two pieces they need to get uh, do, to get out in order to do something productive. Some time was saved there, or I should say some time was lost by white due to black's patience with capturing on the c4 square. Black, by playing bishop b7, which is an excellent move, Black first waits for this bishop to make uh, make one move. Black wants white to invest one tempo with the bishop move before black captures on the c4 square. So what's really happening with this last variation I'm showing you is that the bishop took two moves to get to the c4 square. He played to d3 and then c4. It took two moves, in other words, for white to capture the pawn on c4 instead of one move. Okay, so this is a, a finer little point uh, with regard to having some patience and keeping what we call pawn tension in the position. Doing, being aware of these things are there's again it's adding up these these little uh, timing details uh, are going to. Have, have an influence on who's better developed, who's closer to having their pieces fully mobilized, okay? Having some patience, not yet capturing, playing bishop b7, and only capturing on this square after the bishop has moved. White had to waste some time, took two moves to get to the c4 square, instead of just a point A to point B capture, a one move capture. Okay, let's have a look at just a, a few more examples here. Here we go. A developing move, another developing move. Development, development. D4, developing move, forming a pawn duo. What does black do? He breaks up the pawn duo. That's good. Knight recaptures. Got to get that material back. And now black captures the knight. That's the first non-developing move. He's already developed and he's moving again. This is a mistake. It's not a... It's not one that's showing up. It's not a material mis uh, material mistake. It's a time mistake. It's black's move. Well, a new piece has to come out and about. Bishop c5, knight f6. There's nothing wrong with these moves. Black instead made a non-developing move. And what does white do? Of course, recaptures and develops. White is already winning the time race. White, just by the rules of the chess game, right? White moves first. White's going to have that time edge. White's now up uh, some time here. One, two, three. A king move four. Black needs one, two, three. One pawn move. Four, five, 
six. Down two. Or white is up uh, two moves here. All right. Let's move forward just a little bit more. D6. It's developing. Okay. Bishop's ready to come out. Developing. A6. Non-developing. Let me again emphasize. Do not be distracted by your opponent's moves. Do not be distracted from developing your entire army. After A6 is played, white plays the move A4. That's not developing. I guess white didn't want the move B5 to be played. Bring B5 on. If I'm playing the white side, if you want to play B5, great. You know what's going to happen? I'm going to I'm going to laugh a little bit. I'm going to say, well, it's another it's another non-developing move. Black is really excited apparently about opening up a new door for that bishop because this one here isn't good enough. Uh this is a waste of time. White is being distract white is distracted here and is not getting on with developing. White should be playing bishop c4, bishop f4. New pieces out Again, do not get distracted. Focus on what it is you ought to do in a chess game. Develop, develop, develop. Focus on that time element. A4 was played. Let's go a little bit further. C5, non-developing. It attacks the queen. It creates weaknesses, something that will be touched on a little bit more. <laughs> uh, there'll be a big focus on uh, that topic, but okay. Non-developing, C5. The queen goes back home. It's it's an underdeveloping move, but I could see why you would want to do that. Playing here or here gets in one of the two bishops, you know, gets in the way of one of those guys. So, okay, queen d1, it's fine. Developing, developing. Okay, we're back on track. We're getting some developing moves in. g6, another one of those moves. Opens up a second door for the bishop. Some time is uh, being wasted here. Castles, bishop here. How are we looking? Two moves away uh, to be uh, d have that direct connection between the rooks for white. How many moves for black? A bishop move, a king move, a queen move. Okay, so not too bad. I know uh, I'm looking at the numbers for each side like, okay, white needs this number of moves before there's the direct connection between the rooks. Black needs this number of moves. But the main focus should really be on the difference between those two numbers. Is there a difference at all? And if there is... How can, we, how can we apply it? Should we be opening the position or not? Okay. It's the difference between uh, both sides. Uh, the, the time factor for each side is the difference between those numbers. That should really be our focus. Okay, so really not much of a time difference in this one, but this is where white now goes astray. You ready? F4. What's this? A non-developing move. Yes, it forms a pawn duo, but what's wrong with bringing a new piece out? What's wrong with bishop f4? Bishop f4 is an instance of development with an attack. And what are you doing about your d6 pawn? Really nothing. You can't save him. Here's one way you could defend. Under developing. Guess what happens next? White is one move away from being fully developed, and black is one, two, three, four. Let's open the position up. How would you do that? e5, create pawn exchanges, open up files, pawn takes, there's already tactics, bishop sweeps in, the king is running for his life, and this knight is under fire, the rooks are ready to cause the king a headache. Things can crumble in a blink, okay? All white needed to do was continue to develop, get all the pieces out, bishop f4, focus on that time element, get every piece working. White was not yet fully Mobilize. The bishop needs to come out. The queen needs to come out. Here's a wonderful square for the rook, a half-open file. Doing a move as simple as bishop f4 in black is in a very, very difficult position. I would go as far as saying a losing position. Dropping a pawn and just no good. No good here for team black. Okay. Let's have a look at just a couple more examples. In fact, as a close, we'll have a look at a very famous game. Here's the last example here. So, so far so good. Both sides developing, developing, developing. We have no problems with any of these. This is 
a non-developing move. A6. There, this might be the idea here to play B5. There may be some point to it, but as we'll see with Black's next move, the, in the end, it, there's no point to it. <laughs> After Bishop C4, we have that pawn move again, so that's a clear uh, waste of time. So white is up time-wise. Every move white has been playing is a developing move. Okay, black is back on track. Knight C6, Queen D2 developing, Bishop G7 developing. Castles, okay, we have that direct connection. White is already there. Black needs what? King move, bishop move, queen move. Mm, yeah, so he's behind. Three tempi. And what does black do next? E5. There's a problem with that move, isn't there? Do you see, do you see the problem here? What's wrong with the E5 move? Black is down time-wise and is apparently welcome to a pawn exchange, really? The position wants to... Op uh, black is welcome to the opening up of the position when they're behind time-wise. This is a terrible move. But as white, how might you react to such a move is an important question. I see many players do the following. D5. And I'm not quite sure why a move like D5 is played. I'm going to take some guesses here. D5, I think, might be played for the following reasons. One, I think many players like to have one of their pawns attack a piece of greater value, attack a knight, bishop, queen, rook. Okay, They like to have that happen, but I wonder if uh, some other thought might be, you know, maybe one other reason why white might want to play the move D5 is maybe because they think, oh, well, you know, it's not only attacking the knight, but... It's one step closer to queening. I'm just speculating here. I'm just trying to provide reasons for maybe why uh, a move like d5 is played. I think the primary one, however, is, well, I you know, I get to advance one of my pawns in my opponent's position. I get to attack their knight. But it's, it's neglecting this element of time. d5 is ignoring this idea that when you have a time advantage, you should seek pawn exchanges. What does d takes e5 do? It opens up the d file. The queen has, look at all the different possibilities the queen has, right? Uh, after, after this capture, d4, d5, d6. Uh, moreover, when the pawn is on d5, look at the squares it takes away from the bishop, from the knight. It, it, it diminishes the bishop and knight's mobility. This is not a good move. To close the position when you're up time-wise, no good. Uh, it's, again, it's a general principle. Maybe there's some uh, exceptions to the gen uh, some exceptions, but again, a general principle. Open up the position when you have that time edge. Capturing on e5 is best. In fact, it will net some material. Chop, 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 chop again. King is uncastled. There goes a pawn. Soon, a rook is going to develop and attack the king. This is bad news for Team Black. Clearly, the main point: when you're up material here, you should seek pawn exchanges, okay? As black, why are you playing e5? You should not be welcome to pawn exchanges, okay? Now, as a close, I'd like to share with you a very famous game by uh, Paul Morphy, uh, who understood time better than any other player in his time. <laughs> uh, he had a better sense of the element of time, uh, and his opponents were not quite up to speed with the element of time. They were more focused on uh, material, and this allowed many amazing games by Paul Morphy. Uh, this is a game Paul Morphy was playing on the white pieces versus uh, Duke Carl, and it was a combination. He was playing against two guys, Duke Carl and Count Ice Iceward, uh from 1858, Paris, France. Uh, let's have a look at this game, because I, I'm not quite finished with this general principle about opening the position when you're up time-wise. There's also another one that I want you to be very familiar with. Okay. Let's have a look. E4. Development. Development. So far, so good. D6. 
defends, opens up a new door, d4, good move, developing, bishop g4, it's developing, however, after d takes e, uh, what does black do? Black captures, so this last move is the first non-developing move. An already developed piece is capturing the knight. I mean, you might view it as capturing a pin piece. Normally, you should shy away from capturing a pin piece. It's not harmful in any way, but black is basically doing this because if captures, there now would follow queen takes queen, king takes queen, and then the win of a pawn. So in order to uh, in order to avoid the loss of a pawn because of black's decision in fact to play bishop g4 after takes here black has to waste some time capture the knight and after the recapture we have this recapture already white has a time advantage i know in many of the examples i i showed there was a, a time advantage of 3 4 uh in this particular one it's not as great a time advantage but notice we already have an open position we already have uh, we don't need a pawn break it's already we're already there the position is what we might call half opened so uh, if it's already open especially if it's already open there should there should already be a great emphasis on development but in positions that are uh, open there you should really really focus it's it's that much more important to focus on getting your entire army involved okay let's get some more moves in here we have bishop c4 developing actually threatening mate on f7 knight f6 that's a uh, developing move that addresses the threat on f7 I'm not saying uh, it is best, but it's already, even even though there's a slight edge time-wise for white, it's, uh, it's already uncomfortable. Uh, this one way to view it is if you have a slight edge time-wise, if you can start generating threats with these further advanced pieces that you have, this further advanced uh, army that you have uh, deployed, uh, you can start dictating play. You could... I'm starting to touch right now on this uh, the term initiative. You could start to dictate play. You could be the the boxer who's throwing the punches, and it could be your opponent who's having to duck and uh, hopefully avoid getting punched. You could start to dictate play and give direction and make uh, accomplishing what uh, well you can you can make it difficult for Black to continue with completing his own development. Okay, this is highlighted in a great way. The queen b3 is not bringing a new piece into the game, but notice the great influence it has. It's pinpointing f7 and b7, both very weak points. Queen e7, white could, if he wants, go ahead and capture on b7. Queen e7 defends against f7. Queen b7 was not played, uh, this is this would be a fine move. The reason it wasn't played because queen b4 and then the queens are exchanged, and this alleviates some of the pressure off of black, getting the queens exchanged. Instead, white gets a new piece out, continues to develop. Knight c3, what does black do? It's difficult. Notice this queen e7 move is, it was defending f7, but it's getting in the way of smooth the development. The door uh, that was open for the bishop, it still can't come out. There's a piece in its way. c6. Black has to now react to possibilities of a knight jumping into the d5 square, so it's now covered. A new piece is out. Bishop g5 pinning the knight to the queen. White is one move away from being fully or excuse me, having the direct connection between the rooks. We have now the move b5. Black, on the other hand, needs to move the queen, the bishop, the knight, and then the king. He's four moves back. White is just one move away, and also one move away from doing two very good things. 
Uh, note there is Queenside Castle in this particular case. Queenside Castle in this game, uh, in this position, would accomplish two things. King safety uh, and rook activity. You don't always get that. But the d-file is completely opened. If you can castle uh, queenside and have a completely open d-file or maybe a half-open file with a, uh, a target, you know, like a, a weak pawn of, of blacks on the d-file, that might be uh, worth a good look, castling a queenside, doing two, two very good things with your one move. Okay, as the follow-up, black plays b5. And this is the other thing I wanted to highlight here. I've already shared that when you have a time advantage, seeking pawn exchanges, opening up the position is very good. Here's another thing that you have in your back pocket. When you have that time advantage, know this. The number of combinations, the number of tactical sequences that are available to you in a chess game are increased. You have more pieces out, it stands to reason you have more possibilities, You more uh, move combinations uh, are available uh, in, the, in this position for White because of his lead time-wise. Sacrifices, investing some material, in other words, uh, in order to advance uh, your side of the board in order to move your pieces forward investing some material and going in for an attack these possibilities are increased when you have that time advantage white uh, invests some material with his next move sacrificing his knight moving forward dictating play throwing a check at the black king knight d7 queenside castle the rook already is there and Rook here, notice the king, he's caught in the middle. More sacrifices are now present. Rook takes, rook takes, last piece involved. Bishop, queen, bishop, rook, king stuck in the middle. Bishop not playing, rook, sad rook, in the corner. Knight pinned, rook pinned. Is there anything good on the black side? No. What's tried is a queen exchange, but the game finishes off beautifully with bishop takes rook. Knight takes bishop. Queen b8. Offering up the queen. She has to be taken. After knight takes queen. Rook d8. And that's mate. So it's a, it's a really nice game. Clearly. It's a <laughs> very well known uh, game here by Paul Morphy. But the main focus here is the element of time here. Putting it to good use, being familiar with these general principles of opening up the position when you have that time advantage, uh, knowing that the tactical, uh, your tactical prospects, these uh, com move sequences, combinations are increased as you have a time advantage. When we look at it uh, on the flip side of things, if you're down uh, time-wise, if you're still struggling to catch up time-wise, you really shouldn't be so welcome to having the position open up for your, your opponent's further advanced army, your further their further developed uh, pieces. So keep these things in mind. It's not just about having an answer to who is up time-wise, who's winning the race, and you know that's as far as we go with it. We want to know how to apply it. So hopefully uh, I've helped to illuminate this idea in, in uh, the chess game, this idea of the uh, the time element in chess. So... Uh, what I would really like to do, like you to do, I mean, if you're, I, I imagine if you're watching this video, you're really looking to improve your game. And so I think making a conscious effort in every game you play uh, to pay attention to this time element w with each move you're considering, simply ask of yourself, is the move I'm considering developing or productive? And when your opponent makes a move, ask, is my opponent's, uh, is my opponent's move developing or productive? Uh, don't allow yourself, we've seen examples of this, don't allow yourself to be distracted by your opponent's moves to the point where you begin to make non-developing, unproductive moves. This is going to happen, and it takes some discipline on your part. Uh, uh, understanding the element of time and applying it to your play will require your discipline. But in the end, remaining focused on this time element 
uh, in the game, it will improve your play. So uh, I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover in this one. Uh, I'll close with how I usually close it. Um, that's all for this video, as usual. Uh, I hope you got something out of it, and we'll see what's in store in video 12. So that's all for now. Take care. Bye.